Well, President Carter, thank you for agreeing to this conversation today, which is a part of the Carter King Legacy Exhibit at the Martin Luther King Jr. National Historic Site in honor of the centennial of the National Park Service. Uh, from 1971 to 75, you've served as governor of right. Georgia. Right. Uh, and in your inaugural speech, you said the time for racial segregation is over. I, I want to know where did that <laughs> attitude come from and why did you think it was important to say those words at the beginning of your administration? Well, I'd say two major things. One is that I grew up in a segregated society. I lived on a farm in an isolated community called Archery, Georgia. And we had about 200 African Americans there and we had two white families, and mine was the only one that had children my age. So I, I was immersed in an, in an African-American culture from the time I was uh, a little child. My mother was a registered nurse, and she was gone a lot. She served in the, in the surrounding community among the African-American families, quite often on 20-hour duty. She would come home at night at 10 o'clock and leave again at 2 o'clock, and so we didn't get a chance to see my mother very much. So I was raised by African-American women who lived nearby. And uh, so I could see from, uh, from that early experience on until I graduated from high school, the ravages of racial discrimination. And so I was determined to get rid of it as much as I could. And that was one of the reasons I, that I ran for governor. And, and the other reason was that it happened at that historic time in my life that the historic time in America's life took place with Martin Luther King Jr.'s um, crusade for racial equality. And uh, of course, we were observant of the uh, things that went on just as, as a farm child and later as a young farmer myself when I came home from the Navy. So I would say that the combination of the civil rights movement mm -hmm. in my own early life were the two factors that, uh, that led me to make that statement. But the time was over for racial discrimination in Georgia. I can't say that I, that still exists I, to some degree. Right, but. exactly, and I, I, I must admit I, I, I agree with that, even though I was a little kid at the mm -hmm. time. Now, as governor, you actually placed a portrait of my father, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., on the wall outside of the governor's office. You really didn't know my father, but I'm wondering what precipitated that. Although I never knew your father personally, I was just a peanut farmer and didn't have a chance and so forth. But but I was very close to Martin Luther King Sr. and to your mother Coretta and to Andy Young and others that worked with uh, Martin Luther King Jr. And uh, I thought it was time for some symbolic mm. uh, change to take place in the state capitol. <laughs> he, had, he had been criticized, as you know, by many of his state legislators. They had rejected <clears throat> earlier proposals to put his portrait in the governor's, governor's uh, office region. And so I thought it was time to do it. Uh, I think that was the first time I sang uh, We Shall Overcome with Your Mother, as a matter of fact, when we had that ceremony. Uh, there were Ku Klux Klan members walking around and around the Capitol while the, while the uh, portrait was placed there, and we had that wonderful uh, experience together with your family <laughs> members. But, uh, <clears throat> but I think Georgia was ready for it. And um, we had, a, I think, a, a big change in Georgia for a while and also in the United States for a while. <clears throat> but unfortunately, later, including the most recent years, there's been, I think, a resurgence of, uh, of racial discrimination and the uh, division of uh, white and black people. So you mentioned my grandfather, yes. Daddy King, as yes. we all know him affectionately, um, and my mother. Yes. And uh, you've had a long-standing relationship with the King family, um, <clears throat> so just, I was a kid when all of this started. I remember seeing you around, but I couldn't appreciate all of the interactions and the extent of the relationship. So just share with me, so I'll know a little bit about that well, relationship. I knew, I knew Daddy King <clears throat> better than any of the others at first. Mm -hmm. When I was running for governor, uh, <clears throat> one day I, I remember I was campaigning in, in a Milledgeville to make an area, and I had missed breakfast and I had missed lunch. And I got to see your, your grandfather about noon, and I remember sitting there while he ate a big bowl of a big plate full of uh, fried chicken and collard greens <laughs> and cornbread. And I, 
the third main thing I remember about the first meeting with your grandfather was my mouth watering while he, <laughs> while he ate lunch. He, it was kind of, it was kind of, yeah. it was about two o'clock in the afternoon. He just figured I had already eaten, otherwise he would have invited me to join him. But, uh, but he was a great help to me when I ran for president. Mm -hmm. And when I got in trouble with some misplaced words on, on answer to, to other much more aggressive and, and, and ugly interviewers than you are, uh, he would bail me out, and your mother did too. In fact, Coretta came all the way to California to make a speech uh, one time to, to help me when, when some people accused me of being a member of a, of a segregated white church in Plains, Georgia, the Plains Baptist Church, where I was baptized. <clears throat> and she came out to California to testify that that was the way it was all over the South, and that uh, I didn't have any choice, as a matter of fact, even if I wanted to take a choice. So, so your family helped me be president, as a matter of fact. And I have said in many speeches that I would never have been considered as a candidate for president of the United States from the Deep South had it not been for Martin Luther King Jr. and the Civil Rights Movement. In fact, I remember being at your inauguration and you had my grandfather <clears throat> to do the, I think it was the closing prayer? It was, was it? yeah, it was. And it was a rip-roaring yes, prayer. That, very it, memorable. People may have forgotten the rest of the <laughs> inauguration of I mean, who was inaugurated. But they remember that closing prayer of his. Yes, that it was, was a, wonderful. That was a very important moment in, in our life, and of course, I know in, in your yeah. uh, the beginning of your. Uh, and, and, you know, and, and your mother, by the way, was was in my our private quarters with me and Rosa, oh, and, and watched wow. the ceremony. Wow, now, I don't remember that. Yes, yeah, she I'm was. To, I don't even remember how old I was, but I was <laughs> fairly young. Um, as, as president, um, you've done something that no president before or after has done, which is the creation of um, more national parks. You've created 40 uh, national parks and you've protected over 157 million, that's a lot, <laughs> acres of land for future generations. Why was that important uh, for you? We more than double the size of the National Park Service, we tripled the size of the wilderness areas. Wow. And one of the most significant things I did was in 1980 when I signed the uh, law mm -hmm. that created the Martin Luther King Historic Site. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was with your mother uh, when we announced that I was going to do that in 1979, and it was 1980 when I signed that bill. So that's wow. kind of brought the Carter Center and the Martin Luther King Center uh, together, not just uh, geographically, because they're close to each other, but I think historically as well. Mm -hmm. But you, you did more than any other president. But, so well, that's significant. Benjamin Mays, Can't miss that. Benjamin Mays <laughs> made a statement one time. I don't know if he wants to, well, but wanted to take it back before he passed away. But he said, I did more for the, um, for the black education system than any president who ever lived, including wow. Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> wow, 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 wow. And I was an honorary, you know, PhD, I got an honorary doctorate from Morehouse so College. the first, first one I ever got. We all know that human rights has been very important for you and uh, has been a guiding principle in your administration as well as your work with the Carter Center. Where do you feel you've had the most impact in that regard? Well, I didn't really see any difference between civil rights and human rights. Mm -hmm. I guess human rights to me was more of an international scope, what the United States of America could do to influence the rights of people in other countries. <clears throat> and I'll just give you one quick example at the same time. When I became president, uh, almost every country in South America was a military dictatorship. Mm. Uh, in mm. Colombia and uh, Chile and Argentina and Brazil and Uruguay and Paraguay and so forth. <clears throat> and by the time we were able to let the people speak freely, the indigenous people, the African Americans who had moved over to Latin America, Within 10 years, every country in South America was a, was a democracy. Wow. So that, that's a tangible proof mm -hmm. that people were waiting for the human rights policy that, that I established. <clears throat> when I gave my inaugural address, mm -hmm. I pointed out that there would be two main goals in my life. One was to enhance human rights, the other was to maintain mm -hmm. peace. And I was lucky enough while I was president, I think unlike any other president since mm -hmm. the Second World War, not to have a launch of missile or fire a bullet or drop a bomb on anybody. So we were able to maintain peace, which was another thing that I inherited as a commitment of my life from Jesus Christ and also from your father. Now talking about your legacy, in your 
um, Nobel Peace Prize acceptance speech, you said, God gives us the capacity to choose. You can choose to alleviate suffering. You can choose to work together for peace. Now, obviously, for a lot of people, that's difficult to do, but you chose to do that. Do you feel that's your legacy, that you chose to do these things? Well, there are two things that have guided my, my life. One uh, is my Christian faith. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the other has been the experience that I've had growing up and, and coming in contact with things around me. And Jesus Christ is, is, our, is the Prince of Peace. Mm -hmm. And so I committed myself at the beginning of my term as president to maintain peace, not only for the United States, but for other countries as well, including Israel and Egypt and, and China and that sort of thing. And human rights we look on as a very broad-based, uh, very broad umbrella under which we operate. I think it's, I think it's a basic human right of, of a person to live in peace and to have not only uh, freedom of speech, but also a home in which to live, and uh, adequate education to take advantage of the talents that God gives us inherently, and, and a chance to have a, a, you know, an opportunity for a job and so forth. I think the basic rights there. So I tried to do what I could in, in those respects. The Carter Center now is devoted to, to the same things, a peace process. We have. We spend most of our money on health programs. This year, for instance, we'll treat over 80 million mm. people in, in the world, wow. primarily wow. in Africa, against very serious diseases. That's about 10 times as many as live in wow. the state of Georgia. And, and we also uh, have just finished our 101st troubled election to bring freedom and democracy to people. Uh, and we try to preserve peace as well. So we're still working with the basic principles of Christianity. And uh, that's the same leadership and guide and inspiration that I pointed out in my Nobel speech that, that guided your father to do, to do his yeah. great work. And we all know that if more people would embrace that spirit, yeah. our world would be a much better place. Wouldn't it be place? nice if God's yes. kingdom could prevail, you know, yes, with, it with would peace be very and harmony nice. so and love and we, forgiveness? Yes, <laughs> and so we hope and pray for more people like you and, and my father. Uh, as we continue to move ahead. So thank you for this conversation today. Thank you. Um, well, I'm so close that the Carter Center and the King Center are very yeah, close together. You yes, exactly. To and other. I want to thank you um, for your relationship with my family, uh, ex especially my mother, and helping her uh, to really um, further develop my father's legacy and work. And perhaps you more than any other president has aligned with the legacy of my father That's in terms of the work you have done. So thank you very much. Well, uh, one of the things that I learned very quickly uh, in dealing with your family was that Coretta King was not just a wife of a great man. She was a, <laughs> she was a great woman yes, with a mind definitely. of her own and ambitions and ideals yes. that were equal to those of any other human being that I've ever known. Well, thank you. Thank you. You are very much appreciated. Thank you, Denise. All right. It's a pleasure.